once again, we can turn to thee. We thank thee, our Father, for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee, our Father, for the cross work. We thank thee, we as thy people can indeed rejoice in sins forgiven. We thank thee, our Father, once again, at the end of another day, we indeed be found in thy very presence. Once again, to listen to thy very voice. And we thank thee, our Father, for thy precious word, left a record for our teaching and for our learning. One of all we could say, <clears throat> One of old could say, thy words were found and I did eat them. They were joy and rejoicing to my heart. Now we thank thee for thy word. A word which guide us along life journey. Thy word, O Father, which encourage us, whether we in the down in the valley experience or on the hilltop. We thank thee for thy precious one. We pray, O Father, for the saints. We pray, O Father, for those who are unable to get in online, on, on, on listen to thy word. We ask of thee once again, we need to be encouraged once again, we listen to the voice of the Lord. We pray for the time we're living in, time of uncertainty, time of unrest. We thank you, we as thy people, our Father, are waiting for the glorious appearing of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for thy servant, we thank you for the blessing of these many years, seeking to help the saints along life journey. We ask of thee that he might be to find help tonight, thyself. Be with us tonight, O Father. We give you thanks, we are Savior. Amen. Good evening, one and all, and thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure and a great privilege to minister the Word of God to the people of God. To please turn with me to the book of Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah and chapter 1. Nehemiah and chapter 1. The book of Nehemiah and chapter 1, and we'll start reading in verse 1. <clears throat> the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And we trust the Lord to bless the short reading of his word. Now first, please allow me to share with you what I intend to do and how I intend to explore the book of Nehemiah with you during the four sessions allocated to me. Now there are a, var a variety of ways to approach and study the book of Nehemiah. My intention is to trace some themes throughout the book by looking at the man of God, the people of God, and the place of God, and see where and how they fit into the narrative of Nehemiah. For session one tonight, I will give an overview of the book, a bird's eye view. We want to have a big picture, a look at the big picture. For the second session, in two weeks time, the 16th of September, we will look at Nehemiah, the man of God. For the third session on the 30th of September, we will look at the Jews, the people of God. And for the last session, 7th of October, Jerusalem, the place of God. So the first session tonight, simply an overview of the book of Nehemiah. The book of Ezra and Nehemiah were originally two parts of one book. One in the same book, and that for a good reason. Because together, they tell the story of God restoring his place and God restoring his people. It's a single story that begins in Ezra and it ends in Nehemiah. And for that reason, 
Nehemiah is sometimes called, or in the past, it was called Second Ezra. Nehemiah is the last historical book of the Old Testament. Now, although Esther, the book of Esther, appears after it in the Bible, you will find that the events in the book of Esther occurred in the time period between Ezra chapter 6 and chapter 7. Nehemiah appeared about 35 years after Esther appeared on the scene. These three books, Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah, although they are positioned in the first half of the Old Testament, they really represent the end of Jewish history in the Old Testament. They are often referred to as the post-captivity books or the post-exilic books, along with the prophets and the prophecies of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, as they all relate to the nation after the return from, from exile in Babylon and in Persia. In this overview of Nehemiah, I'd like to draw your attention to the following. We first want to look at the problems in Nehemiah or the problem in the book. Secondly, we want to look at the period of Nehemiah. And then we want to look at the places in Nehemiah and then the purpose of Nehemiah. And finally, we want to look and spend more time on the plan of Nehemiah. So the problem and the period and the places and the purpose and lastly, the plan. So let's start with the problems of the book. This book is concerned with two problems. And those two problems are stated right at the opening verses of chapter one. We read in verse three. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province, province, province are in great affliction and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. There was a problem with the walls of Jerusalem and there was a problem with the gates of Jerusalem. Let me tell you a story about the Great Wall of China. This wall is more than 6,000 kilometers long. And it was built to keep invaders, to keep out the invaders from the north. The construction of the wall was started by the first emperor of China, approximately 200 years after Nehemiah, after the events in Nehemiah. The Chinese people realized the importance of strong city walls and strong city gates. There was no way anyone could break through these gates and these walls. However, in AD 1644, just about 400 years ago, the Manchu people to the northeast of China, they broke through the Great Hall and they overran China. How did they do it? They did this by bribing a Chinese general to open the gates. You see, strong gates are never enough unless it is guarded and maintained and looked after. And so after 70 years in exile, the Jews had returned home and they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. We find that in Israel. They were able to worship God in their own land now. But the city's walls and the city's gates were in ruins. The once great capital of the promised land was now a depressing heap of rubble. And the people of Israel was exposed to her enemies. At this time, the Jerusalem wall had been destroyed, which means the people of God were unprotected. And they were exposed to the attacks of the enemies from all quarters and from all directions. 
And during that period of time, they were persecuted and they were murdered and they desperately needed someone and they needed help from somewhere or from someone. At this time, at this time, Nehemiah heard about this and he set out to restore the city, the city walls and the city gates. However, he discovered that the city walls were broken down physically because the people were broken down spiritually. This is Nehemiah's story in his own words. It is about the restoration of God's place and God's people both physically and spiritually. You will find that Nehemiah writes in the first person. His story is peppered with personal commentary. We know when he's afraid. We know when he's angry. In chapter 5, he says, um, I think it's verse 6. He says, and I was angry when I heard the cry. We see Nehemiah resorting to prayer on every occasion when he, when he, when he hit problems. As he acknowledges his weakness and his dependence upon his God. This gives us a look into the mind of an Old Testament man of God giving us examples of how to lead the people of God, how to deal with problems and disappointments and difficult difficulties, how to deal with difficult people and circumstances. My brother and sister, I hope it will become personal for you as well. And that as a result of this ministry, you will rise to the challenge and start building for God. You see, New Testament writers do not quote Nehemiah at all. But that by no means lessens its importance or its significance. We need the book of Nehemiah. We need the message of Nehemiah thousands of years on as we acknowledge our own brokenness, our own shortcomings, and our own failures in the things of God, the problems in Nehemiah. What about the period of time that Nehemiah covers? There were three returns from, from exile, from Persia in particular. The first return was under Zerubbabel. And then 80 years later, there was a second return under Ezra. And then about 10, 11 years later, there was the third return under this man, Nehemiah. The event in Nehemiah took place in Jerusalem during the 5th century BC, about 90 years after the first return of the Jews from exile in Babylon under Zerubbabel. At this time, Nehemiah was in the service of the Persian king Artaxerxes. This king was the son of King Ahasuerus of the book of Esther. Despite the positive portrayal of Artaxerxes in the book of Nehemiah, history shows this king was far from just. He killed those who opposed him, even his older brother Darius, the rightful heir to the throne. Now for this king to agree to Nehemiah's request, this was huge and therefore hard to comprehend. However, God's providence is seen here in action as he had made the king favorable towards both Nehemiah and the Jews, just as we see in the book of Esther. God still rules in heaven and God still rules on the earth. We used to sing a, a song, this is my father's world. Whether it was the periods that covered the Old Testament times and whether it was the period that covered the New Testament times or even our own times, God is still in control and he will remember his own. This is my father's world. The problems, the period of time. Let's look at the places in Nehemiah. The events of the story this narrative 
take place in two significant cities. The first city is Sushan, and the second city is Jerusalem. Those are the two significant cities, places found in the book of Nehemiah. And so the book opens in the city, the Persian city of Sushan. Later that year, Nehemiah traveled from Sushan to Judah, to Jerusalem, leading the third of the three returns of the Jewish people following the 70 years in exile in Babylon. But most of the book of Nehemiah centers on the events in the city of Jerusalem. Both these cities were important, were great, great cities. They were both capital cities. Susan, however, was not the only Persian capital, but it was only the winter capital of the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire today, of course, is Iran. It was renamed Iran in 1935. It was here that Nehemiah served as the king's cupbearer in the royal palace. In the next session, we will see this is a very important position. The city of Jerusalem, on the other hand, has also or hasn't always been the capital of the Jewish nation. Following the death of King Saul, God instructed David to go to Hebron, where he was anointed king over the house of Judah, 2 Samuel 2. The house of Judah was the southern portion of the area known today as Palestine. The house of Israel was the northern part. So you have the two parts in Palestine. The northern part was the house of Israel and the southern part was ruled by the house of Judah. That's where David was. So after his anointment, David ruled the house of Judah in the south with Hebron as its capital. A surviving son of King Saul ruled over the house of Israel with Samaria as its capital. So there were two capitals in Palestine. After a seven year reign over the house of Judah, David was finally anointed king over all Israel. Judah and Israel, 2 Samuel chapter 5. And when David was made king over both Judah and Israel, he needed to find a capital which was not associated with either Hebron or Samaria, the capitals of Judah and Israel. So David decided on a city which was on neutral ground with no association with either of these capitals, with no association with the house of Judah or the house of Israel. And so David chose Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Because this was a place independent of the traditions of the people. Jerusalem was a place where allegiance was only given to the king, where all loyalty was to the king alone. When David conquered the city of Jerusalem, he made it the political capital of the nation. And shortly after, it became the religious capital as well. Today, it is the only capital that Israel um, acknowledged. It became known as Zion, the city of David, the city of God. It became the place of God. My brother and sister, are you there? Are you in a place independent of the traditions of men? Are you in a place that's independent of the traditions of denominations? Are you in a place independent of the traditions of brethrenism? A place where the king's word alone rules. A, king where, a place where allegiance and loyalty is to the king alone. Is that where you are? It was here in Jerusalem that most of the events in Nehemiah took place. And unlike the Chinese empire, about 2,200 years later, 
The people didn't realize the importance of strong city, city walls and strong city gates. Because we read in verse, verse 3, the wall of Jerusalem is now broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. What a condition for the place of God. The places in Nehemiah. Let's further look at the purpose of Nehemiah. Whereas Ezra focuses on the rebuilding of the temple, Nehemiah focuses on the rebuilding of the city and the people, the place of God and the people of God. Both Ezra and Nehemiah were concerned with the story of how God reestablished Israel in the land he promised her. So the return from exile was exciting. They were going back to the place that God has promised them. But it wasn't all it was expected to be. Nearly a hundred years after the first exile's return to the city, things were not as they were supposed to be. Yes, they were back in the land, but in spite of all the expectations and in spite of all the longing to be back in order to serve and worship God with all their hearts and with all their might, we've got a new kind of exile, an exile in the land. The temple was no picture of glory. The city walls were broken down. The gates were burned with both the people and the city being exposed to constant danger and attacks. It leaves the readers, it leaves us longing for something more, thinking there must be something better, something better coming. The 70 years of exile in Babylon and in Persia have finished. The physical exile was over, but a spiritual exile now gripped the Jews in Jerusalem. It affected both the Jews and Jerusalem, the people of God as well as the place of God. A man of God was needed to address the problem and God raised up Nehemiah for that very purpose. The book of Nehemiah is the account of the physical restoration of the place of God of Jerusalem, the repopulation of the city and with the help of Israel the priest, the spiritual restoration of the people of God. The last thing we want to consider is the plan or the structure of Nehemiah. And we'll spend a little more time um, in this section. The plan of Nehemiah, the structure of the book. Unlike some of the historical books, which are mainly narrative, story, Nehemiah is written in a variety of styles, a variety of genres. It has narrative, but it also includes lists and physical descriptions and prayers and the law. And since it has different genres, it can feel a bit disjointed. It is therefore helpful to look at the big picture to get an overview of the book, a bird's eye view of the book, to see how everything fits together. Taping, taking a step back, before we dive into the details of the text, it will help us to see the book's primary purpose and how the pieces relate to the whole. Then, not only will you see where the book is situated in the story of God's people, and God's overall plan. But we will also be able to zone in on the areas that speak to our current situation and benefit from it even today. This book is concerned with two problems. Again, stated right at the opening verses of chapter one. And they divide the book neatly into two parts, two sections. When Han and I visited um, Nehemiah and Sushan. Nehemiah asked him about two things. He asked him in chapter one, verse two, he asked him first of all, 
concerning the Jews, and second of all, concerning Jerusalem. His concern was for the Jews and for Jerusalem. And that is the two parts, the simple two parts of the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was concerned for the Jews and for the Jerusalem, for the condition of the place and the condition of the people. The place needed reconstruction, the people needed reinstruction. And so the first part of the book deals with Jerusalem, and the second part of the book deals with the Jews. In the first part of the book, Nehemiah restores Jerusalem in a physical sense. When he heard that the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates are burned with fire, in verse 3, he gets permission from the king to rebuild the city, to restore the city. The governors of the surrounding territories viciously opposed Nehemiah's effort. But the wall was finished in just 52 days. That's the first part of the book. In the second part of the book, Nehemiah and Ezra restored the Jews, not now in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. Ezra read the law of Moses, the word of God to the people. He re-instructed the people in God's ways, which were forgotten at the time. And the people committed themselves to obeying God. Being closely linked with a work for God among his people, both Ezra and Nehemiah seem to follow a similar pattern, a similar pattern and a similar plan in their books. In both books, the first half of the books refer to the restoration of that which is physical. And in the second halves of the books, it referred to the restoration of that which is spiritual. So let's explore the plan, the structure a little further by starting with a brief outline, a summary of the book. As noticed early on, the book divides neatly into almost two equal parts. Chapter 1 to 7, Nehemiah restored the place of God. Chapter 8 to 13, Nehemiah restored the people of God. In the first section, the focus is on the place. In the second section, the focus is on the people. So let's work our way through these two parts and observe the main concerns of each chapter within these two sections. The first section, chapter 1 to 7, the focus is on the place. And I want you to note and observe as I work my way through chapter 1 to 7, how the focus remains on the place, Jerusalem. Chapter 1 to 7 deal primarily with the Holy Land, with the focus on the center of the land, Jerusalem, the city of David, the city of God, the place of God. So in chapter 1 then, chapter 1 starts with a concern for the people of God, which led to personal prayer and supplication. Upon hearing of the ruinous state of Jerusalem, the place of God, Nehemiah returned to the city with the intention of rebuilding it, restoring it. This is accomplished despite the opposition of the surrounding peoples. His focus was the restoration of the place. In chapter 2, Nehemiah's concern and Nehemiah's prayer in chapter 1 went much further than mere empty words and, and empty promises. Because here in chapter 2, Nehemiah acted on his concerns and he secured the king's permission to travel to Jerusalem in order to inspect the damage for himself. He discovered that the damage was both physical and spiritual. There was a problem with their hands. They failed to put their hand to the work of the Lord. But there was also a problem with their hearts. Their hearts were far away from God. That's what we find in chapter 2. In chapter 3, 
He convinced and inspired the people to join him in building and repairing and restoring the walls of the place and the city and the gates of the city in the face of tremendous danger and opposition. They put their hands to the work of rest rest restoring the city and their hearts were in it as well this time. Coming to chapter four. When the work of God and a work for God commenced, the devil started his own work of opposition, using the enemy from the outside. The Jews experienced opposition from the neighbors. They first mocked them for undertaking such a difficult and such an expensive task of rebuilding the city, city walls and the city gates. But when the people faithfully and steadily made progress, their mockery turned to a plot to attack the builders. Nehemiah responded by arming the builders with building equipment as well as fighting equipment, warfare equipment. They were focusing on the place. In chapter 5, when opposition from the outside failed, to stop the great work for God among his people, the devil started to attack them from the inside. He caused disputes among the people themselves. And that has proved over the years to be a more successful and damaging ploy by Satan. Nehemiah this time strived after unity among the people because a lack of unity will not only slow down the work, will not only stop the work, it had the ability to also destroy the work. And chapter six, the work continued as Nehemiah helped the people to overcome these obstacles. But now the enemy tried a different approach. This time they tried to undermine Nehemiah's pers Nehemiah personally by slandering his reputation. Satan still does that. Satan will sometimes try to attack God's people and especially their leaders in a very subtle way. But at times, he does it with a full-on frontal assault as observed here in chapter 6. But God, the ever-faithful one, is always ready and willing to protect his people regardless. In the end, the people completed the, the wall around Jerusalem in 52 days, according to chapter 6, verse 15. That brings us to the last chapter in the section, where the focus is on the place of God. Chapter 7 highlights the importance, not only to build for God, but also to protect the place of God. It teaches us that it is important to start building and to start a work for God. But it is more important to maintain and to continue that work in all faithfulness in line with God's work. And so chapter 7 ends and the first half of the book concludes with everything living or everyone living in the towns. It was now time for rest. The work had been completed. However, this was only the beginning of Nehemiah's mission, mission and vision. With the place of God restored and with the place of God now safe, it was a good time to address the reason for Jerusalem's condition in the first place. The people neglected the word over a good number of years. And that was exactly what was needed for them to be restored. It started with an emphasis on the word, which brings us right to the start of the second half of this book, where the focus is on the people. We've seen in chapter one to seven, the focus is on the place. Now in chapter eight to 13, you will notice that the focus shifts to the people. The focus is on the people. And so chapter eight, verse one, starts with this and all the people and all the people 
gathered themselves together as one man. There was unity among the people. That was what Nehemiah was striving for earlier on. Unity among the people. All the people gathered themselves together as one man. Why? The book was brought out. And it was read to all the people. And we observed here a respect for the word of God. As verse 5 tells us, they stood up when the word was read. They were attentive to the word. They accepted the word of God. They responded positively by weeping over the neglect of the book. And then they rejoiced in it with a great joy. It led to the keeping of the feast. Isn't it interesting to note the people's reaction to the word of God? Upon hearing the, the, the law read and expounded, verse 6 says, they shouted, Amen, Amen. But then in verse 9, it says that they wept in response to the reading of the book. I wonder, do we also have some emotional reactions to the reading and the teaching of the word of God? My brother and sister, does it cause us to weep as the weight of our sin sinks in? Does it bring rejoicing that an infinitely holy God would give his own life to make us holy? I hope it does. By shedding tears, the people realized and acknowledged that they had broken the law that was being read to them. And it leads us right into chapter 9. Chapter 9 is the chapter of fasting. It's the chapter of confession. It's a chapter of repentance. Why? Because in the previous chapter, they had been exposed to the word of God and the word of God exposed their sinful hearts. They saw themselves for who they really were as the book was opened in chapter 8 and it led to repentance. Repentance. You see, repentance is more than just sorrow for sins. Repentance is more than simple, simple regret. It is more than contrition before God. Repentance involves the necessity of turning away from sin. It involves a discontinuance of the wrong practices and our wrong deeds. It is a vital change from evil to good, from vice to virtue, from darkness to light. However, a turning away from sin is never enough. It involves more than that. Because many have turned away and many today turn away from sin. They stop doing this. They put this behind them. But it only leads to a void that is filled with subsequent wrongs. That's not repentance. True repentance is always a turning from and a turning to. A turning from our sin, from ourselves and a turning to God. And true repentance is seen in the lives of the Thessalonians. Paul writes to them and he speaks about the fact that they turned from idols to serve the living and the true God. They turned away from something and they turned to God. Repentance, however, is not only for unbelievers. It should be seen more often in the life of the believer as we confess our transgressions and our constant failures to God both individually as well as collectively as assemblies how often do we repent when last have you repented in turning your back on your sin and the sin in your life and turn to God to fill that void in this chapter, chapter 9, the exposure to the word of God led them to see themselves from God's perspective, to see them for what they really were. And they realized that they have fallen short 
And so they fasted. And so they confessed. And so they repented. Chapter 9. In chapter 10, with the focus still on the people, in light of their confession and their repentance, the people now commit themselves to God and His Word by sealing a covenant of promises with God. The people bound themselves into covenant with God to contribute to the house of God and to promote the house of God and to protect the house of God and to serve in the house of God. You will find this interesting expression, the house of God, dominating most of chapter 10. It is the great focus of the chapter. As you find this expression, house of God, in almost every verse from, chap from verse 32 to 39. Nine occurrences altogether. Again, in line with the context of the second section of the book, where the focus is on the people, the activity in the house of God is that of the people and the ties that they brought and the offerings that they brought to the house of God. In chapter 11, after a census revealed the underpopulation of Jerusalem, various families were chosen to live within the city walls. For a city to prosper and to be great, it must be populated. It needed people. But not many desired to live there because for more than 70 years during the exile, Jerusalem had been nothing but a ghost town. In this chapter, Jerusalem is being populated with those who willingly offered themselves to dwell in the city. And the leaders were the first to respond in chapter 11. They were the first to relocate to Jerusalem. It was good to see the leaders setting an example. Leaders must always set the pattern by their lives and by the example. They had no right to expect the people to live in Jerusalem, to follow, if they themselves were not prepared to live there. What a lesson. In chapter 12, chapter 12 is about the dedication of the restored walls of Jerusalem. But again, the focus is still on the people. In this chapter, the Levites were brought from all the places to Jerusalem for this important task. The Levites had many responsibilities in the life and the worship of Israel. But one of the most important, job, important jobs they had was to lead the people of God in worship and praise to God. Now that, my brother and my sister, has not changed at all. Everyone from the priestly family still has the responsibility for worship and for praise. But who are the priestly family today? The New Testament teaches very clearly that every believer, whether brother or sister, whether young or old, everyone is a priest. We are a kingdom of priests. Peter in 1 Peter, chapter, 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter calls the believers a holy priesthood. In verse 5, he says, Ye are a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. He then proceeds in verse 9, and he calls us not only a holy priesthood, but a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood that ye should... Show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. As priests, we have the responsibility and the privilege to worship privately, but also collectively when the saints gather for that purpose. Men do it audibly and sisters inaudibly in silence. Can I ask you a question, brother? Do you lead the people in worship on a Sunday morning? It's your responsibility. It's your privilege. Sister, 
Do you silently add to the wonderful fragrance of worship ascending to God when the saints come together for worship? It's your responsibility. And it's a great privilege. The focus is ultimately on the people and their response to the word of God in chapter 12. The last verse in this chapter tells us that they sanctified the Levites. And the Levites, in turn, sanctified them unto the priest. They sanctified the holy things unto the Levites. And, the, and, and in turn, they sanctified it unto the priests. No wonder chapter 12 concludes with praise and rejoicing. Everything seems to be in place now. The place was restored. The people was restored. So did the problem, or did it solve the problem of chapter 1? The, the problem about the place and the problem about the people of God. Sadly, according to chapter 13, it didn't. Chapter 13, the people had not long renewed the covenant when they broke it once again. In this chapter, we see them violating the Sabbath and intermarrying with the surrounding nations. This was an occurrence of the same problem seen 11 years ago during Ezra's time. Back then, they confessed their sins and they were restored. However, just after just one decade, the people were guilty of exactly the same sins. The German philosopher Hegel says, we learn from history that we do not learn from history. Is that true of our times? With all the reforms of Ezra and Nehemiah, we would expect the nation to now enjoy the goodness of God's kingdom. This, however, was not the full, the final, the ultimate arrival of the kingdom of God. They proved it. Sin still reigned and death still reigned. And brother and sister, if we are not careful, and if we continue to allow the flesh to have control over us, we will also find ourselves exactly where we don't want to be and exactly where we shouldn't be spiritually. What was Nehemiah's answer to the people going backwards spiritually? The people were doing what they've been doing before and they failed God over and over and over again. Did he give up on them? No. Nehemiah kept on feeding them with the word. Nehemiah kept on holding the word before the people of God. And we find that also in the New Testament. With all the problems among New Testament, assemb New Testament assemblies, the solution was always the word. Not programs, the word. Not compromise, the word. To Ephesus, Paul said in Acts chapter 20, for I have not shunned to clear unto you all the counsel of God. And here we've come to the end of the Old Testament historical record. And you'll find the heart is still wicked, wickedly deceitful, above all things and beyond cure. God has wrought a great deliverance for his people by bringing them back from captivity. However, a greater deliverance, even greater than the Exodus, must yet be coming. A greater kingdom, greater than David's, greater than Solomon's, still awaits us. That is the eternal kingdom of God in which there is no sin and no darkness and no problems. Is there a need for the place of God to be restored? Is there a need for the people of God to be restored? If there is a need for restoration among us, brother and sister, whether it was in Nehemiah's times or ours, the answer and solution is found in the word of God alone. In chapter 8, that was the turnaround for the people of God. There was a return to the book, and it made all the difference. Do you want to see a difference in your assembly? Return to the book. Do you want to see a difference among the people of God? Return to the book.
As we close, the story of Nehemiah is a thrilling example of what can be achieved for God in the most difficult of circumstances. Nehemiah in this book was faced with what appeared to be an impossible task. Yet remarkably, the task was accomplished in a very short amount of time. He achieved in 52 days what most of us would have found hard, if not impossible, to accomplish in 52 weeks. The message of Nehemiah is that God's work is never easy. And God's work is never complete. It teaches us the importance of beginning a work for the Lord. But also the vital importance of simply carrying on from day to day. Assembly life is never easy. There's always work to be done. There's always problems to be solved. There's always attitudes and, and, and personalities to be dealt with. But the importance of the message of Nehemiah is to refuse to giving up when the going gets tough. How do we get through it all when we face obstacle after obstacle? How do we get through it all when there are problems, not only from the outside, but also from the inside? One thing that got Nehemiah through was the realization of his own weakness and the strength he found in God. And throughout all the difficulties and the problems, he found that the source of his strength was the joy of the Lord. And in chapter 8, verse 10, he says, For the joy of the Lord is your strength. A key verse in the book. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah, and not Esther, represents the very last of the Old Testament writings. Malachi, on the other hand, represents the last of the Old Testament prophetical writings. And there's some strong similarities between the two. Both refer to intermarriages with foreign wives. Both refer to the failure to pay tithes. Both refer to social injustice. Historically, the next recorded event was the coming of the Messiah. Following Nehemiah and Malachi, God's voice of revelation was silent for about 400 years. Yes, God has spoken through these men. And he's spoken through others in a great way. But the next message of God, the next word from God, came 400 years later with the birth and the revival of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. His message will not only be greater, it will be full, it will be final. The Hebrew writer says about his message in chapter 1, and I read it. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in the past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Mr. Darby says, in the person of the son. Oh, it must have been ter a terrible time for the nation when there was no word from God for 400 years. However, God didn't remain silent forever. And today, he continues to speak through Christ. This time, he speaks to both sinner and saint. And he will speak until the return of Christ. The return of Christ will silent, silence God's word to sinners. And although in a different context, Paul's words in Romans 3 and 19 are very applicable. He says that every mouth may be stopped, that the world may be silent, that all the world may become guilty before God. Then will the sinner be silent before God? What about the saints? His return will not silence the saints. But his return will cause the saints to open their mouths in eternal songs of praise and worship. Problems on earth, my brother and sister, can bring a silence in the soul. A silence in the life of many a believer. But we will never be silent in heaven. We will sing and praise him for who he is and what he has done for all eternity.
Nehemiah records the fortification of the place, chapter 1 and two, 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 7. And he records the restoration of the people, chapter 8 to 13. In doing so, Nehemiah continued the work that Zerubbabel and Ezra had begun many years early on. Zerubbabel's contribution had been the rebuilding of the temple. Ezra's contribution was the beautifying of the temple. Nehemiah's contribution was the restoration of the place and the people. What is your contribution? What are you doing for God? I trust the Lord will bless his word. Thank you for listening. I will continue with the rest of the series in Nehemiah in two weeks' time when we shall look at and trace the man of God through the book. And I know everyone is busy, but if you do have the time, please read through Nehemiah to benefit more from the teaching over the next few weeks. Shall we pray? Father, we thank thee for men like Nehemiah and Ezra, men who built for God, we thank thee for men like Paul and Silas and Apollos, men who built for God in a later day. We thank thee for many today that are building for God. We pray for faithfulness in the local assembly in Takapuna and in every local assembly associated tonight. Father, we pray that we might be find, found faithful as stewards of God, and that considering that our building and our contribution and the material that we use will be assessed in the day to come, we look forward to a, a welcome, a faithful servant. Father, we pray for thy blessings upon the word in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you, Brother Marius. Thank you for your word this evening. Uh, just a few announcements before we um, unmute everyone. We are still under lockdown restrictions in uh, Auckland, so we continue with the meetings on Zoom on the Lord's Day. Our brother referred to the book of Malachi, and we in our ministry on the Lord's Day continue with the book of Malachi. We've come to the last chapter, chapter, chapter 3. So take time to read chapter three, and we're looking forward to seeing the Lord's people on the Lord's Day. Then next week, God willing, the next Zoom ministry meeting will be taken by our brother Ian Lowe, and he continues his series on the Lord Jesus Christ and his cross work. So thank you for joining. It's lovely to see all those, and we thank the Lord for help uh, granted to brother Marius. He sent me a message to say he needs the prayers of the Lord's people, and so we assured him. And we assure him now that the Lord's people will be praying for him as he continues through the series on Nehemiah. So thank you for all for joining. We'll unmute everyone so that you can share a word with Brother Marius. Thank you, Marius. Welcome. Yeah. Is Yvette okay? Yes, she's good. You might keep <laughs> She's sitting across from you. Okay, hi, Yvette. <laughs> mm. <laughs>